Good afternoon. It is such a tremendous joy and, and privilege for me to be here. I've had the privilege of teaching a lot of different courses at various Bible colleges. I have been blessed uh, to teach now at 25 different Bible colleges. Next week, I will be at yet another one in Australia, and the week after that, one in New Zealand. So we will be 27 by the time we get uh, through this month. But man, this is exciting. This was the first college I ever came to teach at outside of the United States, and I've been coming every year, except for the years were blocked by the pandemic. I've been coming every year since, and it is a great joy. It was 28 years ago, uh, but we, we missed two years because of the pandemic. So, uh, or, or maybe it was 20, I don't know, something like 28, 29 years we've been coming. And um, it, it is a thrill to be here. The topic, a student at another college suggested this topic to me last January, and I fell in love with the idea when he did, because he said, this is the concern we have. The Bible describes salvation from a number of different angles, different doctrines. And every new term has been confused by some people. And people treat it as if, boy, these are all isolated, and sometimes even if they're contradictory, I just talked to a person the other day, said, well, he knew what he preached about this, contradicted what he preached about this, but you just have to trust the Lord to straighten it all out. And no, we don't. God is very, very clear. Human beings get confused. God doesn't have any confusion. And, and so the idea is that we would take all the doctrines of salvation and look at them and look at how they fit together as one harmonious picture. Sometimes when Christians get confused, maybe it doesn't damage us as much as we might think, but because we already know the Lord, we've had years growing in the Lord. But can you imagine unsaved people hearing people describe salvation and it's contradictory? And how are they supposed to know what it really is? Some years ago, I was pastoring in Chicago and a young lady graduated from a college in Michigan and she'd taken a job in Chicago. She moved uh, very close, just right around the corner from the church I pastored. She came in a sunny service and uh, we got acquainted with her and, and she um, was coming to church and she wasn't saved. And she said, she said, I have a question. I don't know if you can help me with this question. She said, I grew up Catholic. I went to the Catholic church and at the Catholic church, they taught me, this is what you have to do to be saved. But she said, in high school, I started going to a Pentecostal church with my friends at school. And at the Pentecostal church, they said, this is what you have to do to be saved. But it was different than what the Catholics told me. And then she said, in college, I went to a Buddhist temple that was there on the college campus. She said, in the Buddhist temple, they said, this is what you have to do to go to heaven. But it disagreed, contradicted what the Catholics said, what the Pentecostals said. She said, can you tell me what I have to do to go to heaven? And I looked at her and said, no. She, she looked at me stunned. She said, you mean you're a pastor and you don't know? I said, that's not the problem. The problem is you don't do anything to go to heaven. She was stunned at that answer. We, we had several conversations together. She still couldn't grasp that salvation is based on what Jesus Christ did for us. Christ died for us. And, uh, but she said she really, and she kept, she kept coming to church. She said, I really want to understand. And finally she said one day, she said, my boyfriend is coming in from out of town. He'll be here next Sunday. She said, would you be willing to just sit and talk with us she said, I'd like to sit and talk until, however long it takes until I understand what salvation is. Okay, we will. And so boyfriend was there and they came to church the next Sunday morning after church was over, went back in my office and said, we're not leaving until you get this. We talked for an hour. 
I used Bible verses. I gave illustrations from the scriptures. I told stories as illustrations. And about an hour into the conversation, the boyfriend got saved. She still didn't understand. We continued for another hour. I've, I've had several conversations with her previously. So I, I've talked and talked and talked with her. And, and I can't think of anything else to say. I've just run out. And I'm honestly, I'm stalling for time to try and think of something. So I asked if she'd be willing with me, took her in, in a song book to a hymn. And I said, would you be willing to repeat this line in the hymn a few times for me? I'm really just stalling. I'm acting like I know what I'm doing, but I don't. I'm just stalling. The line in the hymn is, it is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. She said, okay. It is enough that Jesus died, that he died for me. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Fifth time. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And the sixth time, I can't duplicate it, at the top of her lungs, she was screaming, It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. That's what salvation is all about. And so much confusion exists in the minds of people. And that is our biggest challenge. And so what we, the challenge we have and what it is we need to do constantly, we need to keep presenting salvation in clarity so that people can understand. So the concept behind this course was that we would look at all the doctrines of salvation in one class, in one program, and see how if when they're properly explained, they all fit together clearly. It's last February, not long after I was here with you all in, in class, had a chance to go to Israel, first time. Was with our church. My wife, my only son, my daughter-in-law, my grandsons were with me. And we went to things in Israel together. And uh, we, the pastor Scudder had told me, he said, I'm going to want you to preach on this trip, but I don't want to tell you when, and I don't want you to prepare. But that was unusual. We went through the whole thing. And uh, the last day, I went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ prayed for us. And there I was in the garden, thinking about in this spot, Christ prayed for me. Then we went to Golgotha and we saw the hill where Christ was crucified for us. I thought, there is where he died for me. Then we went to the tomb. And, and they, they let groups of seven go in at a time. My family of six went in the tomb together and stood in the empty tomb together. Saying, this is where he rose from the dead in triumph over sin in the grave for me. Then we came out to a little outside oratorium and pastor asked me to preach. I was so emotional. It was hard to put into words and still it's hard for me to put into words. I only spoke for about five minutes, which my son said was a miracle on the same order of the miracles we'd been talking about. But I said, it's, I can only think of one thing for me. He prayed that prayer for me. He died that death for me. He rose from the dead for me. That is the essence of salvation. We're going to talk, and I've entitled this course, The Just Shall Live by Faith. Because I always found that to be a fascinating verse. 
It's in Habakkuk 2, chapter 4. It says, the just shall live by his faith. But according to Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38, and Romans 1.17, this verse refers to the gospel. It's a verse about salvation. It's because of faith that a person becomes spiritually alive. The just are not just in and of themselves. I am not just because I've been so good. It's because of faith that a person becomes spiritually alive. The just are not just in and of themselves. They are counted as just. They are counted as just. Because they have believed God about salvation. They are made alive. Born again by faith. Martin Luther, Roman Catholic priest who had been through quite a background, he'd done everything he could think of to try and earn his salvation as a Catholic and as a Catholic priest, and yet he knew it wasn't right. Nothing had been right. And so he finally created such a problem in carrying out his priestly duties that he was removed from being a priest. And they made him a college professor. And so they often say, if you can't do anything right, they make you a college professor. So there he was, he's a professor at Wittenberg. And they assigned him to teach the little book of Habakkuk. And he came to this verse. The just shall live by his faith. And it bothered Luther. He said, what in the world does that mean? We're used to saying the just shall live by his faith. And we're talking about trusting the Lord to watch over you. That's not what that phrase means there it means being made alive he said he said what sense are you made alive by faith so he got to studying he found out that verse was quoted in galatians 3 11 which is a passage about personal salvation and it's quoted in hebrews 10 38 which is a passage about personal salvation it's quoted in Romans, Romans 1.17, which is a passage about personal salvation. And it finally broke through to him. You become alive because of faith. Come alive spiritually because of faith. It's not how you become alive physically. It's how you become alive spiritually because of faith. So in thinking about this class, I chose to entitle it The Just shall live by faith. The doctrines of salvation in harmony. So many, many wonderful writers have written about the glories of this incredible plan of salvation. I'm not trying to take their place or duplicate what they've done. I've collected some of the most wonderful things that have been written about this. Because very often, at least in our independent Baptist circles, we have not focused enough time on this at the level that we should. And, you know, we'll mention it and we'll, we'll do doctrines and we'll, we'll say, okay, I believe in salvation by faith. But the Bible uses a number of terms to describe this to us. And so we're going to try, at least in a little sense, do justice. What the Bible has to say about how the just shall live by faith. Okay. First, we're going to look at Lewis Perry Schaefer, one of several authors that we'll refer to several times. And he's writing about the word salvation from a book he entitled Salvation. The word salvation is used in the Bible as a work of God in behalf of man. In this present dispensation, it's used as limited to his work for individuals only and is vouchsafed to them upon one definite conclusion. Okay? Sometimes in the Old Testament, the Lord uses the word salvation to describe what he's doing for Israel, and that salvation in a different sense, but in terms of individuals, it's what we're talking about, the Joshua Luba faith. Too much emphasis cannot be placed on the fact that now, according to the Bible, salvation is the result of the work of God for the individual. A result of the work of God for the individual. The young lady I'm using as an illustration at the beginning of our course. 
She's trying to figure out what works she's supposed to do to be saved. And different religious people have told her, do this, do this, or do this. So well, what is it you do? And that is where so many people miss the whole thing. It is not what we do. It's what he did. Okay. Eventually, the one who is saved by the power of God may, after that divine work is accomplished, do good works for God. For salvation is said to be under good works. And those who believed are to be careful to maintain good works. Good works are evidently made possible by salvation. But these good works, these are good works which follow salvation. Do not add anything to the all-sufficient and perfect saving work of God. As used in the New Testament, the word salvation may indicate all or a part of the divine undertaking. When the reference is to all the work of God, the whole transformation is in view from the estate wherein one is lost and condemned to the final appearance of that one in the image of Christ in glory. That's where the discussion of salvation ends. You and I are in heaven conformed to the image of Christ. That was glorious. Now, when the reference, um, the larger one of the use of the word, therefore combines in as many separate works of God for the individual, such as atonement, grace, propitiation, forgiveness, justification, imputation, regeneration, adoption, sanctification, redemption, and glorification. The two following passages describe the estate from which and the estate into which the individual saved. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Or from 1 John. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. There could be no greater contrast of possible estates for man than those described in these passages. One day, we'll see the Lord. Either through death, we pass from this life, or in the presence of the Lord. Or in the rapture. If we're alive when the rapture takes place, we're translated in a moment, in an instant, in the blinking of an eye, twinkling of an eye. We see the Lord. When we see the Lord, we will be like the Lord, because we'll see him as he is. This transformation, it must be conceded, rather than representing the greatest thing impotent man can do for God, represents the greatest thing the infinite God can do for man. The greatest thing the infinite God can do for man. greatest thing the infinite God can do for man. For there is nothing to be conceived of beyond the estate to which this salvation brings one, namely, like Christ and conformed to the image of his son. From J.K. Strombeck, who, like Schaefer, wrote a number of good books on the subject of salvation, books that aren't paid much attention to in independent Baptist circles in our day. Most of these books go back to the early 1900s. But J. F. Strombrock, we're going to quote from several of his books. One of them we're quoting from right here is called So Great Salvation. Because of man's inborn sinful nature, causing him to depend upon himself. Our old sin nature wants credit. I'll earn my salvation one way or the other. Depend on himself. He insists upon contributing something to his own salvation. 
It's the hardest thing for a man to learn that he cannot do so. That is undoubtedly why the Bible at every point reiterates the fact that what is done in salvation is of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It therefore seems needful to point out still further God's own emphasis on the fact that salvation is of him and him alone. To think that man can be brought back into fellowship with God, into union with him by anything that man can do or that man can contribute is to fail to realize the awful gulf of separation between man and God that was caused by sin. The awful gulf of separation between man and God that was caused by sin. You'll hear folks, ah, you folks believe that uh, your works is not a part of salvation. You make salvation cheap. Now it's far from that. Salvation is so expensive. I have nothing to pay. It's so costly, so dear, so precious. I have nothing to offer. But by the glory of God, salvation has been provided for me. To hold that a man can contribute anything toward being saved is to fail to understand the finite cannot contribute to the infinite. It is to fail to realize the utter helplessness and sinful condition of fallen man. It is therefore necessary for all to realize with David the psalmist that salvation belongeth unto the Lord, that the Lord is my salvation, and that he only is my salvation. It's a very important question that comes to every person. It is this. How is it possible for any individual to enter into all the things that are included in salvation? What must be done, if anything, to be saved? Again, the story we started with, the illustration we started with. The Bible, when properly interpreted, gives a simple and definite answer. Salvation is by grace on the part of God and received through faith on the part of man. By grace you save through faith, that not yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is not a single good thing to say about me relative to to my salvation. It is that the Lord saved me. Grace is one of the greatest words in the Bible. It speaks not of what man does for God, but what God does for man. It may be said to be God's abounding provision through the operation of his infinite or unlimited love on behalf of one who will believe in him. It is the kindness and love of God toward man whereby all that the Christian is and all that he has is provided through Jesus Christ. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Delivered him up for us all. God is love, and grace is that love in action. Grace is always unmerited. In fact, man's demerit is that which makes grace possible. Had man not sinned, then Jesus Christ could not, by the grace of God, have tasted death for every man. I am not on my way to heaven because I'm a good guy, because I'm a preacher, because I've been baptized, because I didn't do this particular sin, or I did do that particularly good deed. I am on my way to heaven because Christ tasted death for me. The operation of grace is not hindered by sin, nor is it limited by it thereby. For in sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God commendeth his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Someone has said, grace works not by what it finds, but what it brings. All that's included in salvation is by grace. It is not only that which God does to remove man's sin and guilt and restore that which was lost by the failure and sin of man. It includes all that God does in conforming redeemed man to the likeness of his own son and placing him in a state of eternal glory. Salvation is full of sense 
including the past, present, and future work of God for the believer, is one continuous series of acts of grace. One continuous series of acts of grace. We're going to cover about 20 different things that the Lord calls salvation. Adoption, redemption, about 20 different things. Every single one of them is the product of the grace of God. I don't earn a single one of them. I don't earn reconciliation. I don't earn propitiation. I don't earn the atonement. I don't earn eternal security. Every single one. Every single one of them is the grace of God. It includes, all, all that's included in salvation by grace. It's not only that which God does to remove man's sin and guilt and restore that which was lost by the failure and sin of man. It includes all God does in conforming redeemed man into the likeness of his own son, placing him in to a state of eternal glory. Uh, there used to be a lot of jokes that went around. And in the joke, somebody dies, they go to heaven. St. Peter's standing at the gate of heaven. And, and, and uh, St. Peter said, well, this is what you got to do. Or St. Peter will ask him, why should I let you in heaven? And, and the person will respond with something. Well, that doesn't happen. Uh, nobody's waiting at, said, say, at heaven's gate to ask you a question. St. Peter's not at the gates of heaven. But if he was, and he really did ask you that question, why should I let you in? What is the answer? Because of what Jesus Christ did for me. But when you get that, it answers a lot of questions in life. Why should I dedicate my life to living for the Lord? Because of what Jesus Christ did for me. Why should I be faithful to the teaching of the word of God, even if it makes me unpopular? Because of what Jesus Christ did for me. Why should I trust the Lord when man says so many different things? Because of what Jesus Christ did for me. Salvation in its fullest sense, including the past, present, future work of God for the believer, is one continuous serious act of grace. Okay. The Word, the Son of God, was made flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And of his fullness of grace have we all who believe received and grace for or upon grace. By the grace of God that Christ tasted death for all men. Sins are forgiven according to the riches of God's grace. Sinners are justified freely by his grace and grace reigns unto eternal life. Paul said by the grace of God I am what I am. And God said his grace was sufficient for him. By grace there is deliverance from the power of sin in the life of the believer. It's by grace the believer maintains a proper conduct towards a world with fellow saints. Gifts for perfecting of the saints and the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ are said by grace to be given to the saints. There is grace by which believers may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Liberal giving of material things out of deep poverty and under great trial affliction, but with abundance of joy is said to be a grace bestowed on the churches in Macedonia. God is able to make all grace abound toward believers, but they will always have sufficiency in all things and may abound in every good work. There is grace to help in time of need. The heart becomes established with grace, and God has given an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. In addition to all this, there is a promise of grace that is brought to believers as the revelation of Jesus Christ. Surely all this is grace upon grace by him who is full of grace and truth. Salvation is all by grace. When you understand that, lots of things come together. I mean, lots of things come together, come together at that moment. Why do I have eternal security? It is the grace of God. Okay? It's not because I've earned it or deserved it. 
and I, I had been in many, many conversations with people, including recently, who will say, well, you can't tell me somebody who is faithful to church is going to heaven. Uh, how often do you have to go to be faithful? Is it once a week? Twice? What if it's four times? My church only has three services. I have eternal salvation because of the grace of God. Because my salvation is based on Jesus Christ dying for me. Jesus Christ dying for me did not start my process of salvation. It is the whole thing. And I know lots of folks wrestle with this. I'm so grateful. Apparently folks explain this to me so well. I got saved as a 10 year old. I had not been in church before that. Apparently they explained it to me so well when I was 10 that I was able to understand because I've never had any questions about this. As a child, it must have been explained to me pretty well because I got it. Christ died for me. Do you ever have questions about yourself? Of course. But I never had any questions about Christ. I never had any doubts about what Christ did or what Christ accomplished or what his intention was. Well, uh, let's stop and take about a 10-minute break, and we'll come back and, and get on time.